Before we get started, we'd like to thank Merchants Bonding Company for sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety. Merchants Bonding Company is the largest surety-focused company in the United States. If you want a common-sense surety approach, ease of doing business, and a first-class experience, see what Merchants Surety experts can do for you. To learn more, go to MerchantsBonding.com. Now, on to our show. You're listening to Let's Get Surety. Let me hear your bonding talk with Kat Shamapande. Hey everyone, it's Kat Shamapande. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Let's Get Surety. I have with me today my co-host Mark McCallum, CEO of NESBP. Hey Mark, thanks for being on. Hi, Kat. My favorite podcaster. I'm glad to be back. (laughs) My favorite co-host. I'm glad to have you back on with me. (laughs) So today we're going to be talking about personal guarantee from a corporate officer or agent as a specific issue. It's a pretty interesting topic, I think. And to dive into this topic with us, we have Todd Regan. He's a partner with the firm of Gordon and Reese. Hey, Todd. Thanks for being on. Hey, guys, thanks for having me. This is my favorite and probably only podcast. So uh, (laughs) (laughs) thanks for having me again. This is my my second and only time on a podcast. So I love to talk surety. So I'm happy to be here. We're glad to have you back uh, for a second time on this episode, Todd. We'll, We'll share a link to your last episode as well with everyone. So in case they missed it, they can go back and check it out. It hasn't been accidentally deleted or anything, has it? No, no, it's up there. <laughs> so, Todd, before we dive in and talk about this topic more, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you found yourself uh, in the space as an attorney and in, sure, in the surety space, and a little bit about Gordon and Reese? Yeah, sure. So, um, for over twenty years now, actually, I've focused my practice on uh, the construction and surety industries, and I actually took a class in in law school. Uh, construction law, which is a pretty rare class to have, and I, and I really enjoyed it and sort of hit the ground running from there. I think I wrote a, a article on, on surety ship when I was in, in law school, and they didn't see too many of those, I can tell you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, you know. um, and so, yeah, that's why past 20 years I've, I've practiced construction and surety law, um, primarily in Connecticut and Massachusetts and New York. Um, where I'm licensed, that's, that's where I focus my practice. And at any given time, I usually have cases pending in all three jurisdictions. So I have to make sure I remember where I am on a, a particular uh, day. Uh, <laughs> and I'm currently the head of Gordon and Reese's Surety Practice Group. Obviously, I'm a member of the NASBP's Attorney Advisory Council, and I've had the honor to write several articles in, in Surety Bond Quarterly and hopefully Everyone's enjoyed reading them as much as I've enjoyed writing them. Um, And yeah, I've got significant experience in in both uh, construction claims, also in negotiating and drafting construction-related agreements. I I find if you've been in court fighting over what specific contractual provisions mean, you're in a better position at other projects when you're up front negotiating what the terms are to say, well, here's why I can't accept this change to this language because I've been in court. I've heard the arguments as to how that's somehow ambiguous. So it's it's always good, I think, to have both those uh, types of experience. Uh, and I handle all types of construction claims from you know, project delays and, and lost of, lost efficiency, you know, uh, incomplete and defective workmanship claims involving contractor termination, and of course mechanics liens and, and payment bond claims, which we all hold near and dear. Um, my firm is Gordon Reese. Uh, we're a pretty unique firm. We're the only firm in the country with offices in all 50 states, uh, which is a, a big benefit to our clients. We can help them wherever they are and have issues come out uh, throughout the country. Uh, and we're in the top 10 in construction uh, executive magazines list of construction law firms. We have about 150 construction attorneys. So that's that's, that's me and I firm. And Todd, weren't you given a an honor in 2023 as well in Connecticut? Yeah, that's right. I was actually, I was named um, or, or voted as um, Construction Attorney of the Year for Hartford. So that was, that was a great honor. And especially because it's, um, it's, it's pure, pure, pure voting. Uh, so, so that's, that's great. Um, it's a, it's a nice honor. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So it was nice to be appreciated. Yeah. Congratulations. congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
So if we're going to dive in and talk about personal guarantee uh, from a per- from a corporate officer or agent, maybe we should start by discussing what what is a personal guarantee and what are some of the scenarios where this might come into play? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, it comes up in a variety of, 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 of business transactions, you know, in the construction context where I've seen it come up most often would be in uh, credit applications or agreements by material and equipment, equipment suppliers, particularly when there's new customer relationships they're getting into. Um, there'll be typically a credit agreement that'll have language in there uh, saying that the individual signing is agreeing to be, you know, that the company is agreeing to be liable and that the individual is is agreeing to personally guarantee payment of the obligations. And, and that's a very risky um, thing that I think sometimes language could be hidden in fine print of, in the bottom of a purchase order. Um, people may not know that they're looking at these. It might be a lower level, you know, uh, you know, contract engineer who's not um, necessarily reading these things that closely and, and are signing these things. And so it, it can be a big risk, something that from the company signing it perspective, they have to really be uh, careful to, to read what they're actually uh, actually signing. Um, and then, you know, from the supplier's perspective, because I do represent a number of um, you know, material equipment suppliers as well. Um, on the flip side, it's, it's really an important tool for them. Um, and I guess, it, you know, to put it in the, in the surety context and, and, and do another sort of plug for why projects should be bonded, um, you know, if the project is bonded, right, and the GC is bonded, then, you know, the, the suppliers are typically going to be less concerned about having to have these personal guarantees in their uh, credit agreements um, because they know there's a payment bond on the project and there's security. And, and if you can point that out to them, they can say, oh, this is a bonded project. Okay, fine. Uh, we're not going to require the, um, you know, the president of this, um, you know, uh, site work contractor to, to, uh, to sign personal, because we know we're going to get paid. We know we're security, you know, but when there's no bonds on the project, um, you know, it can really be necessary for the supplier to get this personal guarantee to protect themselves, and and it's so it's sort of a can be an unintended consequence of having, you know, unbonded projects is that you know the lower tier subs who are typically the ones who are entering into these agreements, right? They're the ones who are uh, typically you know getting the rental equipment and, and and signing agreements with suppliers. You know, you could be in a position of putting the principles of these uh, subcontractors. In a, in a position where they have to give personal guarantees in order to get this um, materials and equipment to the project, so that that could be a sort of unintended consequence also of not having having uh, having bonds. Um, you know, another sort of factor is that um, on private projects, um, you know, the supplier who may otherwise require a personal guarantee, they can obviously protect themselves. With mechanics liens, right? Mechanics lien is a great right. tool mm-hmm. on a project, and and I've had tremendous success for clients uh, getting them paid where we've had a mechanics lien, um, and we wouldn't have gotten paid had there been no mechanics lien on the project, or would have been we would have had to take a huge haircut um, on the claim. But the mechanics lien is a imperfect um, security uh, instrument. It's it's complicated. It can be there's a lot of room for mistakes. There's very strict notice provisions and timing provisions. A lot of traps for the unwary. Um, in mechanics, and if you don't have a if you don't have an attorney on staff or, or who is on retainer and you're doing it yourself, um, uh, there could be a lot of pitfalls. Uh, and mechanics is not always, even though you can file it, is not always worth anything. You know, there could be um, no equity in the project because there's huge mortgages right. ahead of you. Or the another big issue that people don't perceive is the lienable fund or the lien fund issue, and that's if uh, by the time your lien is filed, if the owner doesn't owe any money to the general contractor, there's there's really no no fund for you to to hit with your lien, uh, so the lien could be worth nothing. Uh, so so you know for all those reasons, you know a, a personal guarantee in a credit agreement 
this particularly for a material supplier or, you know, or a rental equipment supplier with a new a new customer they haven't done business with is really a sort of a crucial way of protecting themselves. Um, it, it gives another layer of protection then for that party. And, it uh, does. Uh, assuming you can collect on that guarantee, right? Right, right. And, and, and obviously, if you're going to have a guarantee, um, you want to make sure it's enforceable and you have all the proper uh, bells and whistles. And, you know, before getting into seeing the specific nitty gritty on that, I, I will say that it's, you know, my personal experience having a credit agreement or, or other agreement as a material supplier or, or material rental equipment supplier that has a personal guarantee is can absolutely be crucial and make the difference between getting paid or not getting paid, especially if there's not a bond. I've had um, many cases where, you know, my clients supplied rental equipment to projects and payments went, were okay at first and then they get slower and then they get slower and they're told, oh, don't worry, we haven't got paid by the owner yet or the general contractor hasn't paid us yet. We're going to get paid soon. Just wait, just wait, just wait. And, and then they never get paid, you know, and then maybe a mechanics lien gets filed and it gets ignored. And then maybe, uh, you know, suit gets brought or, or a threat of suit gets brought against the subcontractor by the material supplier. Maybe they're, maybe that gets their attention, but maybe not because a lot of times, um, subcontractors uh, are are potentially judgment proof. That's another point to make. You know, they don't have they maybe they have rental you know m- machinery and equipment that they quote unquote own, but it's financed by it has UCCs covering it, and they're and they have no equity in them, and they're essentially owned by the finance companies. They don't own any. They're never going to own any real property uh, in their in their own name, and they're unlikely to be keeping large cash reserves. Uh, around from year end to year end, other than just to maybe meet their current obligations. So, uh, you know, if if you don't have that personal guarantee, the contractor may very well be judgment proof. I think in my 20 years of of litigating construction claims, I think every contractor or some country on some level has threatened to be judgment proof. <laughs> I've, I've ever been. And, and, and that's, that's often what it is really is uh, um, when parties have claims, especially payment claims, lien claims on these construction projects is quite often a negotiation of not necessarily focusing on the merits or what's right and wrong. It's more on, okay, well, if you bring this through to trial, and you get a judgment against this, you know, what is there, what's the security there to collect? And, you know, what are the costs to you of bringing the claims? You know, so that's, again, just to sort of more detail on, on how having these personal guarantees, um, you know, if, if you can negotiate them or can be absolutely um, crucial, particularly, particularly for, you know, an equipment or material supplier. Um, but again, as we were saying, if you're going to have it, uh, you're going to want to make sure that it's enforceable and you have all the right required uh, contractual bells and whistles. So it sounds like it's not so simple that it's plain on its face. It's going to be enforceable. There is some art and science to that, I imagine, as well. And, I mean, just in general, how do courts look at you know, personal guarantees running from corporate officers. Um, is, are they strictly scrutinized as to the adequacy of the language, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the courts, in my experience, do not like, as a matter of policy, to enforce these personal guarantees from okay. corporate agents and officers. I think there's, and listen, there's a legitimate concern that you have someone signing a purchase order in there somewhere buried in the 10th page of the terms and conditions is some esoteric personal guarantee language or you know, the person signing it was some sort of clerk and didn't understand what they were signing. So, so it's, it's, um, it's really understandable. It's also the sort of the concept, but the other areas of law have this as well, you know, in the, in the, in the veil piercing area as well, is that the courts want to uphold um, the, the sort of shield of, of corporate liability shielding individuals, right? And yeah. it's, it's it's sort of a public policy item where they want to they want to encourage businesses taking on risk, and they want to have certainty. And that when to a certain extent, when someone starts a LLC or a corporation, 
you know, they go into it thinking that they're going to be shielded from personal liability. So this can be, um, you know, this can sort of shake that system up if it's, it's allowed to be done too loosely, I would say. So, but yes, um, in general, particularly in New York, uh, you know, there is a strong presumption against imposing personal liability on corporate officers in the language, which I've quoted in my article, is that there must be clear and explicit evidence that they intended to be personally bound. Um, so you have to have very clear language. And I've you know, researched this issue quite a bit and, and litigated it. And there's been examples where I've looked at agreements and I said, well, gosh, that, lo- that looks pretty darn clear to me that that person is signing uh, and, and should and is a sophisticated business person who is the president of a corporation. And they should they should appreciate and know that maybe they're even represented by counsel, that they were agreeing to be personally liable, but the courts will at times seemingly bend over backwards to find reasons to uh, invalidate it or, or find issues of fact, right? Okay, well, there's issue fact, summary judgment um, denied, uh, go to trial in two years from now uh, and, and argue over what you intended to do when you signed it, right? So that um, that's definitely an issue that arises. Um, and so one of the key, you know, factors, if you want to create a personal guarantee, uh, particularly on behalf of a individual officer um, or owner of a entity, uh, is you have to have them sign twice, right? It's pretty simple, but there has to be a signature line for where they're signing as a representative of the company with, the, with their title, um, you know, president, CEO. But, but there really needs to be a separate line where they're clearly writing also, you know, in, individually as a guarantor. Um, and, and there's even been cases where there were two lines and the individual signed the guarantor line. But then after when they wrote in their name, they also wrote in their title. Uh, and the court looked at that and said, said, well, that's ambiguous. You know, they're. They wrote in, you know, Jack Jones, comma, president right. after their name. So we find it somewhat ambiguous. Maybe he didn't really intend, even though he signed it twice, <laughs> we, you know, maybe he didn't really intend, um, you know, to be personally bound. And, and so really the best practice, I think, there is to have the form, you know, before it's signed is have it be printed out. So really, there's only a place for the individual to sign. They don't, you know, they're not getting a chance to write in their name and and put in their title on their personal line or, or put whatever else they might write in. Um, it's it's completely filled out, and then all they're doing is signing. You know, that's I think that's um, the best practice. It, it sounds like on that basis that even having them initial near that provision may not be clear enough. Because it's not indicating the intent in which they're initially correct. Right. Yeah. Anything that could be found is, and, and, and listen, anytime someone's getting sued on a personal guarantee, you can guarantee, not to use a pun, but you can be certain <laughs> they're going to find right, any argument that they can think of to get out of it and, and any imaginative thing that they can see as to why it doesn't you know, show their intent to be personally liable. So there's anything you can think of will be there. So I think having the terms all um, printed out, you know, really avoids the possibility in the underlying concept here. The, the, the legal concept is the statute of frauds. Um, yeah. And when you're serving as a guarantor, and, and that's a, a sort of an important um, concept that we should discuss is, is the concept of a guarantor versus a co-obligor. But, but if you're guaranteeing the debt of another, um, you're a guarantor, and the statute of frauds has, a spe- has special signing requirements where you has to be very clear that you've signed on an individual basis. And you're, when you're a guarantor, not always, but typically it means that you're what's called secondarily liable, which means that the company has to fail to pay. Right. And maybe sometimes they may even have to get a judgment against the company and and be unable to collect against the company. Then they can go after you, um, you know, as a second or secondary sort of uh, guarantor of the debt. Um, And so then there's a number of other factors, you know, that the courts will look at in terms of um, 
determining whether the agreement really clearly demonstrates the individual's intent to be personally liable. And, and they're pretty straightforward. I mean, this you know, the stuff isn't that complicated, but it doesn't it doesn't always um, get done properly in the agreement. You know, um, one of them is you know, you want to have the individual's name listed right in the beginning of the agreement as a party. You know, in addition to just the company. Okay. Um, sometimes you'll see um, the company's name, and then there'll just be a boilerplate term guarantor, and guarantor will appear throughout the agreement, but the person's name never will in the body of the agreement itself until they just sign on a generic line that says guarantor. That's not so good. Uh, the, courts, the courts don't like that. Um, that they, they they like to see the individual's name printed on the front of the agreement as a as an individual party in addition to the to the um, to the company. Um, uh, another rule, issue that comes up is the individual's role in the company. Um, if the individual is the president or the owner of the company, they're more likely to have been found to have intended to be a personal, personally liable on the debt. But if it's some, you know, employee who's low level, who's just processing contracts and sign, you know, the court is less likely to see that that was an, an intentional uh, undertaking of, of uh, you know, personal liability. Um, and then another factor being the how close the language is to the signature line, you know, is it buried in 50 pages of a five point, you know, 10 point font. You've seen these purchase orders. I'm sure sometimes they have language on the back of them and there's two columns and is it hidden? You know, how close the signature is to the line. I mean, the best case would be really to have, you know, uppercase bold font language right above the signature line uh, saying that the individual intends to, um, to guarantee the debt. And then, you know, a final factor is, you know, is there evidence that the, in the guarantee language was negotiated by the parties, you know, or were there drafts of the agreement traded back and forth by their attorneys where, you know, there, maybe there was limitations to the dollar amount of the guarantee, you know, were there other provisions, you know, or, or is this really just simply a boilerplate form that someone signed? Yeah, that that's something else, um, you know, the courts will, will look at. So there's not there's not one you know particular factor you have to have other than I would say that the two signatures. But really, the concept is you know, is the court going to look at this and say it's quite clearly showing um, the individual's intention to serve as an individual uh, guarantor of the debt. Yeah, so it sounds like um, you don't want any ambiguity that might exist, that it needs to be very clear. And I, I imagine there are certain jurisdictions that have case law that turn on what is uh, ambiguous and what is not. But it sounds like you've kind of delineated a belt and suspenders approach that really will work in a lot of jurisdictions. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and, as I, and as I said, any, any argument you could possibly think of creatively to try to get out of it, uh, will be and has been used, and again, it's a tough. It is a tough burden as the creditor seeking to enforce it. So, if there's any grounds for for question, um, you know, there's definitely a risk as to whether it's going to be uh, enforced. And, and if there's a lawsuit, those will come up in negotiations, and that may, if 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 one of the, if the other side can can raise significant doubt or, or as to whether it's going to be enforced or whether it can be enforced you know, relatively uh, efficiently without years of litigation, you know, that's a that's a, a factor that might, um, you know, might come into play in terms of, of whether the case, you know, settles what the dollar amount is for, um, you know. But I've certainly found that when you have a personal guarantee that looks pretty darn good and you can sue the individual owner of, you know, an LLC personally, that certainly gets their attention and that takes, <laughs> as you could imagine. <laughs> and that certainly changes the conversation from, well, we don't have any money. Um, you know, we'll throw the keys on the table to the company and you can get a judgment against us too. Well, how about we pay you in quarterly installment payments? Um, you know, that, that's, uh, that's quite often how the, how the discussion goes. Um, 
Another sort of issue I had discussed in my article is the concept of being a co-obligor um, right. versus being a guarantor. You know, and you know, the guarantor again is you're 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 guaranteeing the debt of another. If they don't pay, um, then you can go after me, and I'll pay. The concept of a co-obligor is I, I'm a party to the contract. You know, I'm directly liable for payment. Um, you don't have to sue the company first and get a judgment against them. You could sue me directly um, right away up front. And in, and in the surety context, you know, typical surety general agreements of indemnity, uh, you will have individual uh, indemnitors in addition to the company itself and right. to related companies that they own. The individuals signing are not typically signing as guarantors. They're signing as co-obligors. They're individual indemnitors. So if, uh, you know, if something happens and there's a claim, um, you know, the, the surety technically can sue the individuals for indemnity uh, in addition to or in lieu of the company. There's no obligation to get a judgment against the bond principal first and then, um, uh, and then if you don't get paid, go after the individual. So, you know, in that context, uh, a an, an indemnitor is a um, is a co-obligor of the company's um, obligations. Uh, and so, it's actually easier uh, to create a co-obligor uh, relationship than it is um, a guarantee relationship because you know to be a guarantor. You have the requirements of the statute of frauds. You have to have a separate signature. Um, there's more scrutiny. If a corporate officer, you know, agrees to sign uh, onto a, a purchase order or credit form saying that they will be directly personally liable for all charges to their account, um, that makes them more look like a co-obligor than, than a than a guarantor. Um, and if you have the agreement set up that way, um, there's far fewer uh, hurdles to enforcing it. Uh, and um, you, you don't have the two separate signature requirement uh, and you're not holding them liable for the debt of another. They they're have, have been found to be directly responsible for the company's debt uh, and can be sued directly uh, for that. Now, I think a lot of the best practices for a uh, guarantor relationship, I think, would apply. You know, you, you would, you know, if if you're doing this right the right way from the beginning, you would want to have a separate line for sure uh, for the individual who's a co-obligor, and you'd want to have it very clear. Um, so, so you, you certainly want to have all those other sort of bells and whistles in there. Yeah. I guess, you know, sometimes when it comes down to it, I, I've taken this approach in, in certain cases where, um, I've had a, you know, someone sign personally and I, and I've taken the approach that, that no, no, this person is not signed as a, as a guarantor. They've signed as a co-obligor. And, and, and so, you know, it's a it's a lower burden, I think, um, on some of those factors. But so so that could certainly be um, a better approach if you know. Obviously, if the other contract party is 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 willing to sign it and, and willing to take on that obligation. But again, as I said, I think a lot of times you know the the practical uh, situation is that these are just being processed without anyone really giving you know due consideration to what they're signing and okay here's a we need this you know we need this rental equipment for this project it's a new vendor here's their forms okay we'll just we'll just sign it <laughs> you know without um without really thinking of the consequences which could be um can be very significant that's for sure so so it sounds todd there there's a lot of nuance here and there might be jurisdictional differences so it sounds like um, consulting with a good attorney might be a wise thing to do. Would you agree? Yeah, with that? absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I think it's one of the things that we always say to people is actually read what you're signing, you know. And if you don't yep. understand it, 
you know, don't read it. You know, it depends on what your situation is and where you are in the pecking order of the project. And if you're a if you're a subcontractor, lower tier subcontractor, you may not have uh, the ability to make modifications to a contract. Right. And, but at least you should be aware of the risk you're taking on. Um, you know, when you're signing it, and that's not just in the in the um, personal guarantees, but it's other types of contracts as well. Are there no damages for delay clauses? You know, are there pay if paid clauses? You know, are those enforceable in your jurisdiction? Do you know what you're signing? Do you understand that you're taking on the risk of an owner default under those circumstances? So yeah, that, that's that's really what it is. Is it's you know, are you giving due consideration? to what you're getting yourself into and, and, and what you're signing. Yeah. Yep. That's terrific. And Todd, you mentioned the article that you wrote for the Surety Bond Quarterly on this topic. We'll make sure we include a link so anyone can check that out if they want to read some more information on this topic as well. It's been great having you on with us today, Todd. Hopefully we'll get you back for a third podcast sometime. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it. Great time. You've been listening to Let's Get Surety. Brought to you by the National Association of Surety Bond Producers. For more information about the NASBP and its members, visit nasbp.org. Before we go, we just wanted to thank Merchants Bonding Company again for their generous support in sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety. Merchants Bonding Company is the largest surety-focused company in the United States. If you want a common-sense surety approach, ease of doing business, and a first-class experience, see what Merchants Surety experts can do for you. To learn more, go to merchantsbonding.com.